My name is Jim Copeland. I'm the Chief Enforcement Attorney at the South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, super happy to be here today to talk to you all about the uh, FTC safeguards rule and the updates uh, to that rule. A little bit about the Federal Trade Commission. Now, the Federal Trade Commission is very similar uh, mission-wise to what we do, but they do it on the federal level. Uh, their mission is to protect consumers and competition by preventing uh, anti-competitive, uh, unfair, deceptive uh, trade practices. Um, they handle this mission through law enforcement, advocacy, and education without unduly burdening legitimate business activity. So very similar to our mission statement. They were created a little bit older than, than we are as an agency. They were created uh, back in 1914 when President Wilson signed the uh, Federal Trade Commission Act into law. So they have been protecting consumers uh, for, for quite a while. They are organized into a couple of different bureaus. And as a business webinar, I just wanted to make sure that we covered kind of both both sides. Uh, the Bureau of Competition uh, seeks to prevent anti-competitive like mergers, uh, businesses, business practices in the marketplace. They enforce the antitrust laws and they promote uh, competition and protect consumers' freedoms uh, in, uh, in ensuring that there is an open uh, marketplace. The other bureau that they have um, is the Bureau of Consumer Protection. And that is pretty self-explanatory. They protect consumers against unfair, deceptive, or fraudulent uh, practices. They also enforce a variety of consumer protection laws and uh, their actions include uh, both individual company and industry-wide uh, investigations at both the administrative and federal court level, as well as engage in federal rulemaking processes. And that uh, bureau also does consumer and business education. The Bureau of Economics um, is really the uh, bureau that uh, basically analyzes the impact of government regulation on competition and consumers, and they provide Congress, the executive branch, and the public with economic analysis of the um, market processes that they uh, that they oversee. And of course, there various other offices within the Bureau that provide support for their agency. This is uh, very similar to ours. Uh, you know, that's where the uh, executive director is going to be, uh, human resources and things like uh, things like that. Okay, getting into the uh, meat and potatoes of our conversation today. Um, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, uh, which uh, was enacted in November of 1999, it repealed the 1933 Glass-Steagall uh, Act, which when this law was uh, passed, it was one that was uh, very heavily sought by the banking industry. The idea at the time was that people put more money into uh, investments when the economy was good and their money into savings accounts when the economy was was bad. So this law was created, I think, to allow them uh, to do that. As an interesting aside, a lot of uh, legal scholars and the like believe that the merger of uh, Citicorp had a lot to do with the passage of this law. Uh, basically, Citicorp was a, a commercial bank holding company with uh, the Travelers Group, which is an insurance company, um, and the merger created a Citigroup, which combined banking, securities, uh, and insurance services all under uh, one, one roof. <clears throat> 
Now, the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act did not remove the restrictions on banks that were placed by the Bank Holding Company Act of 1956. That act prevented financial institutions from owning non-financial corporations. So, this is why you don't really ever see that. It, it, it Conversely, uh, its result was prohibiting corporations from outside of the banking or finance industries from entering uh, the retail and commercial banking um, sectors. So basically it removed uh, the barriers of prohibiting those banking companies uh, from consolidating into one big, uh, one big conglomerate of a, of a company. But in order to allow that, it contained two key rules of compliance that had to be adhered to by all financial institutions. We're going to touch on the financial privacy rule. I know we're we're focused today on safeguards rule, but you can't really talk about one uh, without the other because both rules or, are born from the Graham Leach uh, Blightly Act. So I hope that kind of makes sense. And in, in, in short speak, that's that's the federal law for you. A whole whole bunch of words to. Uh, accomplish uh, a pretty simple two-prong mission. <clears throat> so the financial uh, privacy rule is the rule that gives us those notices that we all have come to, to recognize pretty immediately uh, that we also get in the mail every time uh, we establish a relationship with uh, financial institutions and they send it to us uh, once a year. Uh, from there on. Basically, the rule requires um, uh, requires uh, for companies to explain how they collect information, how they're going to share your information, how your information is going to be used, and probably most importantly, how that information is going to be uh, protected. Basically, it's a pamphlet that gives consumers their rights as to how to control that information and also explains to them the mechanisms that are in place for them to opt out of any uh, sharing mechanisms. Basically, this is the agreement between you, the business, and the consumer. Wanted to give you just a little screenshot. So, uh, in, you know, in typical federal government fashion, the safeguards rule is uh, 40 pages of this. So I'm not going to sit up here and, and, and read it to you. What I'm going to do is try to distill uh, some of the more important pieces of information. Like, again, you know, I'm kind of meaning this presentation to be uh, a, an overview. We could spend hours and hours going through this uh, rule piece by piece, um, but uh, I would would probably need to run around and, and shake you all uh, back awake, and I'd hate to be the cause of that. So uh, basically, compliance, you know, if you are an organization that handles financial information, and we will get to which organizations those are here momentarily, but uh with with all due uh seriousness um this rule is of utmost importance to you to be sure that you are in um compliance with uh because although it may sound like a lot to do uh it may be some initial upfront cost to do at the end of the day all of it is going to be much much less expensive for you as a business to comply with than to be caught not complying with it. For example, violations of this rule as of the other week, uh, each, each violation of this rule carries a penalty, and I, I don't know why it's an odd number, but to the federal government, each violation of this rule 
incurs a penalty to you as a business of $43,792 per violation. So, might cost you a little bit complying with it up front, but I guarantee you it would be much less than having to pay the penalties for uh, not complying with it. <clears throat> so the safeguards rule was originally issued in 2002. It became effective the next year in May of 2003. It is codified in United States law at uh, Title 15 and sections uh, 6801 through 6809. The um, actual uh, rule that we're going to be talking about is found in the Code of Federal Regulations, which is uh, 16 CFR Part 314. And what this rule does is it basically implements the security requirements from the Graham Leach Bliley Act that we talked about earlier. Basically, what the safeguards rule does in one sentence is it requires financial institutions to develop a written information security plan describing how that company is prepared for and plans to continue to protect its clients non-public personal information and this is important it is both before during and after your relationship with that consumer so this is going to apply to any information of any of your customers past or present regarding your institution's uh, products or uh, services. The safeguards rule forces uh, financial institutions to take like a deep closer look at how they manage private data and requires them to do a risk analysis on their current uh, processes. The Federal Register that I showed you a little picture of a couple slides back uh, features approaches for risk assessments such as evaluating uh, magnitudes of harm. Um, it, uh, it uh, you know, highlights safeguards that are, are commiserate with the risks that they address, um, you know, kind of like industry accepted uh, practices. Um, again, like no process, and this is important too, because again, no process is perfect. Uh, so this, this, you know, this is meant uh, that every financial institution has to basically, uh, you know, do a self-analysis, so to speak, and and figure out uh, how this rule, um, you know, or or how is best for them to implement and ensure compliance. With this rule which is why i always encourage businesses to speak to their corporate counsel because again much much simpler and much much less uh, expensive and more profitable to comply with it up front than to be caught uh, not complying with it the prior safeguards rule and i'm kind of going to go back and forth because you know the the prior rule the new rule the updated rule the, the it's really more of an evolution than it is like three separate rules. So I hope I hope you can bear with me while I do that. But that's really the easiest way to um, explain how. So you might hear me say, you know, prior safeguards rule doesn't necessarily mean that the old one's no longer in effect. It's just it's an evolution of the same rule. So the prior safeguards rule required financial institutions to develop, implement, um, maintain a comprehensive uh, information security program, which consisted of a whole bunch of different uh, categories of areas that they had to address. Uh, for example, you know, administrative, technical, uh, physical um, aspects that the financial institution would use to access, collect, distribute, process, store, transmit, also dispose of, and basically just overall handle 
customer information. This security program has to be in written, uh, has to be in writing. Um, it has to set forth uh, the program um, and, and that program must be appropriate to the size and complexity of the financial institution that it applies to. Uh, it has to address the nature and scope of his activities and the sensitivity of any customer information um, at, at issue. The integrity of customer information um, is, of course, like of utmost uh, importance is, is protecting that data, making sure that uh, that you know where it is, what it's doing, and um, and to ensure that that you are uh, protecting it. The rule also requires that financial institutions have to evaluate and adjust the information security programming um, in light of the the duty to monitor your program um, so you know you have to make sure that not only do you implement the program that you have the program but you also need to make sure that the program is uh, basically current you know if you're in an organization where which i think any more these days all organizations are so uh, technological that you know the advances in technology we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of uh, basically, you know, just basic protection of the uh, data that uh, you collect from, from your customers. So what does this written plan have to include? Of course, it has to include the designation of at least one employee to manage the safeguards, now, again, I always recommend speaking to your counsel because, like I said, every single business, regardless of the industry, you can be in the same industry, but every business operates a little differently. That's what, you know, that's what makes businesses wonderful. They're like people. They're, they're no two exactly the same, even if you do the same thing. So I recommend two employees because, you know, God forbid, you, you know, the employee that you have designated to uh, manage all of this is, you know, on vacation in the Bahamas on, on the day that somebody tries to hack your system. That you just, you need to have two folks doing it. You need to create a thorough risk analysis on each aspect of your business that's going to touch in any way, shape, or form that non-public information, and not just touch, but have access to. Um, you have to make sure that, that, you know, the development, the monitoring, and most importantly, the testing of your programs to secure the information are uh, jam up and, and jelly tight. Uh, you have to adapt the safeguards that you have in place as needed with any ch changes that you make in either the operation of your business or uh, with how you collect, uh, use, and store the information. <clears throat> okay, so some changes. Now we're going to start into the first round of safeguard rule changes. So back in 2021, uh, the FTC released a final revised rule to be published in that federal register. Now that original rule back in 21 when it was released was effective uh, or was set rather to be effective uh, in January of 2022. Um, the applicability date was set to be December. So the rule was going to go into effect and give folks roughly a year uh, to get their programs up to speed and then implemented by that December 9th, 2022. Uh, because of some um, uh, letters and, uh, and comments received, the FTC extended that original deadline until June 9th, 2023. Interesting aside, the commission extended that deadline based on a lot of reports, but a, a letter from the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy 
uh, basically what really swayed the FTC, the commission, was that uh, there was a huge uh, shortage of qualified personnel to implement these programs. Um, and basically, if you remember back then, you know, that was the tail end of uh, COVID and all that stuff. So um, the problems with the supply chains are we're going to lead in delays in obtaining the necessary equipment uh, for upgrading those systems uh, and, and things like that. So basically, uh, the FTC uh, decided that they were only going to, uh, well, not only, but that they were going to further extend certain provisions uh, by six, um, six more months. So this uh, extension basically um, allowed companies to have six more months to designate a qualified individual to oversee this program, to develop that written risk assessment, uh, to limit and monitor who can access basically your information security protocols and compartmentalization uh, protocols. Um, gave you six months to train all your security personnel, develop that incident response plan, and periodically assess the security practice of all of your partners um, that you share information uh, with. So why all of a sudden did they revise it? Well, I mean, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But the safeguards rule had not been touched in 20 years. Um, so basically the technology had just superseded anything that was contemplated 20 years ago. We just had no idea that what we have today was gonna exist. Um, plus the FTC uh, has had a lot of experience going through, I think 80, almost 90 cases during that time frame. So they had the benefit of um, what judges had said about their enforcement actions and, and things like that. Also, there seems to be, or has been a much, uh, much more streamlined um, formed consensus on like reasonable business practices, also increased state regulation. Um, and another one that they listed uh, for a reason why revising was that they had concerns about even the enforceability of the prior rule simply because, the easiest way to say is simply because the words that they used didn't apply anymore. I mean, they used words on, on technology or pieces of information or things like that that just don't exist anymore. And they wanted, I think the biggest reason is they wanted to provide a concrete, you know, everybody likes clear rules. Um, they wanted to accomplish that with, uh, with revising um, these rules, but they also acknowledged uh, that, you know, giving regard to uh, small businesses and, uh, you know, startups, things like that, that they did not, you know, they, they did not want to uh, impose basically like a, it, it's not a one size fits all that they, they wanted to allow some flexibility for, you know, the rule to be applied to a business of um, any, any size whatsoever. Couple of examples of these enforcement, I just thought it was kind of interesting as an enforcement lawyer. Um, back in 2018, we all remember the PayPal Venmo um, debacle. Uh, dealer uh, built, um, that was a service provider, uh, mostly automobile dealers. Uh, they failed to design and implement basic safeguards and failed to monitor their safeguards. Bunch of folks' information was, was uh, exposed. Um, and uh, back in 2020, the Ascension Data and Analytics uh, fiasco, where that company failed to uh, oversee their service providers. It wasn't even them that exposed the data. It was one of their partners. So that case goes to illustrate that 
if you were sharing information that you collect about a business, you need to make sure that whoever you're sharing it with has a compliant safeguards program. And that's important. Or at least, you know, contractually has made sure that uh, that it exists. Okay. So there's a lot of inf <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of information on this uh, on this slide, and that's just about the easiest way I could find that uh, kind of threw it all in one little easy to follow flow chart. The final rule modified the current rule in basically five primary ways. First, the final rule amends the current rule to include a more detailed uh, requirement for the development and establishment of an actual information security program. Good example of this is, you know, the current rule require financial institutions to undertake a risk assessment and develop safeguards to uh, address the risks. The final rule sets forth specific criteria for what the actual assessment must include. So it's, it's basically kind of like a, a crib sheet. Um, for for implementation of of the rule. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as to uh, particular safeguards, you know the 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 final uh, really thing that that they address, you know, access controls, uh, data inventory, classifications. Uh, encryptions, secure development practices, uh, authentication. That's going to be like your your dual factor type uh, type safeguards. Um, information disposal procedures. You know, just because you're finished with the information doesn't mean that you can just you know chunk it in the old circular file cabinet and forget about it. You, you just can't can't do it. The, the final rule does retain the requirement from the current rule that, that the financial institutions have to provide employee training and appropriate oversight um, of the rule, but it adds mechanisms designed to ensure that such training is effective. One of the, one of the studies they did showed that, uh, you know, businesses, although they, they had uh, training programs, they just were, uh, Deficient in, in how in how they uh, were applied to um, the specific business models, and again, that just that kind of highlights the the you have to you know you have you have to craft this thing toward your business model. Another new thing um, for for the rule was that it, it requires periodic exports to the to the FTC to the board, um, which uh, provides senior management basically with better awareness of their financial uh, institutions, uh, information security uh, programs, and um, and the like. Another, uh, I think, important point about the rule, the key updates too, is that it provided for an exemption um, to the uh, the rule. Basically, uh, the FTC kind of recognized uh, that you know financial institutions that collect information on fewer than 5,000 consumers, um, they should be uh, exempt from certain requirements of the rule. And, and we'll get into the particulars here in a little bit. Um, but uh, for example, some of the more uh, burdensome aspects of the rule, uh, smaller businesses don't have to, um, 
don't have to uh, comply with certain. I'm gonna put a big highlight, underline, yelling and screaming it with certain provisions of the new rule. So who does it apply to? Financial institutions. Now, financial institutions is one of those words that is kind of what we call a term of art and is a defined term, which, you know, it sounds pretty clear, financial institution, bank, lender, but believe it or not, it's much broader than most people uh, think. For example, Graham Leach Bliley Act defines financial institutions as companies that offer financial products or services to individuals like loans, financial or investment advice or insurance. Um, now, the FTC has jurisdiction over financial institutions that include, so you can at least assume that if you're one of these following industries, then you must comply. But the FTC has jurisdiction over non-bank mortgage lenders, real estate appraisers, uh, loan brokers, investment financial advisors, debt collectors, tax return preparers, of course, banks, pawnbrokers, automobile dealers, real estate settlement service providers. Um, and that and that's not that's not an exhaustive list. So the kind of catch all the caveat is that it is a company that is significantly engaged in the financial service or production that defines them as a financial uh, institution. All right. Now, the updated revised rule added entities that are incidental to these financial activities and they called these entities finders. So they basically uh, said that a finder is anyone who brings together one or more buyers and sellers of any product or service for transactions that the parties themselves negotiate and consummate. So the FTC also gave a couple of different examples of what could be uh, considered considered uh, finding activities, um, identifying potential parties, making inquiries as to interest, introducing and referring parties to each other, arranging contacts between meetings of interested parties, and conveying between interested parties expressions of interest, bids, offers. So language is broad but remember its scope is significantly limited in the context of the safeguards rule so this is going to mean the safeguards rule we have to always remember that that the safeguards rule is uh, applicable only to transactions for personal family or household purposes so therefore only finding services involving consumer transactions are going to be covered uh, secondly, the safeguards rule applies only to the information of customers which are consumers with which a financial institution has a relationship with. Uh, that's a super good question. So would you say that if we apply for a credit grantor uh, license, we are a financial institution? Um, Again, that's a. I'm gonna. I'm gonna encourage everyone to speak to your. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. I got you. I knew which one you were talking about. Um, it, I would say, if you ask me as an attorney, to be safe. Yes, that's a really good. That's a really good. Um, really good catch-all. But I'm also gonna say that you know, if, if you don't apply for a CGN doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a financial institution simply because 
uh, for example, the CGN has a um, has a gross revenue requirement, and the safeguards rule doesn't have a revenue requirement. Its trigger is number of consumers. So, to answer your question, if you uh, if you have a CGN, then chances are fantastic and you should assume that you are a financial institution unless told differently by an attorney and secondly just because you don't file for a cgn doesn't mean you're off the hook super good question and i hope that i hope my answer made sense if if, if it didn't then uh throw it back up but great question So a little uh, little discussion about what exactly is one of these risk assessments uh, supposed to look like. Um, what is a risk assessment? Um, risk assessments under the safeguards rule have to be in writing. They have to include a criteria for evaluating and categorization categorization of any risks that you have identified to your data. Um, they have to include criteria for uh, assessing, you know, confidentiality, integrity, availability of the info systems and of that um, con uh, customer information. Uh, it has to include requirements that are going to explain uh, how your company is going to mitigate those risks or basically identifying the risks and which ones are acceptable. Um, because as we know, as a business, there are always, uh, you know, business judgment is, you know, is the risk worth the uh, reward. Um, in, in, in safeguards land, again, remember that violations carry a $42,000 plus ticket every instance. The reward has to be really uh you know considered um the safeguards rule does as a matter of fact kind of uh, uh put a point on what would be considered an acceptable risk to the ftc um, and the way they explain that in the rule is that the chance that an event will uh uh be produced is very small um, the consequences of that risk are minimal and the cost of mitigating the risk far outweighs uh, the benefit. Now, I did, I did snatch uh, this chart because I thought that it was like the best way to basically uh, present this information that I found in all of my research. So I do have to give credit uh, to some uh, lawyers up at a up at the Covington law firm for this chart, but um, changes to the InfoSec program requirements. Um, basically, uh, the implementation of the access controls, these are just kind of things that, that we've touched on in our discussion today. Um, IDing, and managing the data that you're using, the personnel that's going to use the data, the devices that's going to store the data, um, uh, and and uh, you know provide a risk assessment to to those um, processes, programs, facilities in place, um, and encryption of that customer information when it's at rest, as well as when it's in transit over the external networks. Um, wants you to adopt, you know, some secure development practices for internally developed applications. You know, if, if you're in the, the business of, of creating uh, phone apps or anything like that for a financial company, this rule is going to apply to you. Um, implementation of multi-factor. Now, we have to use it on all of our machines. I, I'm sure uh, most of you out there listening to me have it set up with, uh, with your machines, you know, that's the, uh, that's the, you know, you, you, you log in, you put in your username, you put in a password. And when you have done that step correctly, then there is a second step. Like uh, for us, it, it sends a, um, 
like a code to another device that we have to input so that you know it's just that second level of check and balance so that's what they mean by um, multi-factor authentication um, and again and, and I'll, I'll drill on this and I, I know I'm repeating myself about the disposal but that's usually where most folks uh, get in trouble is with the disposal because that you can't uh, you can't forget that you're not you know you're not just done with the data when you're done with the data you have to be sure that it's disposed of correctly and you also don't need to keep data that you don't need to keep uh, I'll even back up further and say one more you really don't need to collect data that you don't need that's like the easiest way to avoid a lot of this is if you don't need the information don't ask for it chart's gonna gonna continue and i just wanted to uh you know this is kind of the i couldn't fit the chart on all one page and make it uh, big enough for for me to see it much less expect an audience to look at it so these are just the additional um changes uh, in a easy to follow chart a couple of ones that i do want to uh point out that's very important audit trails monitoring and logging of user activities uh, we do it with our systems here basically and and i recommend it to any I, I, if i were advising businesses i would advise it not I, I know it sounds very big brother but it's for your own good and for that of your employees uh, monitoring and log like literally every key click button stroke key typed is cracked basically and, and it's not like somebody is sitting there watching it happen but if there were a problem then say you know somebody could go and say well goodness this you know this social security number was emailed but who who did it and you know you can be able to go back and say well this machine this user on this day at this time did that a couple of changes to the actual oversight requirement i wanted to uh talk about and right before we i'm, I'm going to use our last uh, few minutes to talk about the updates to the updated rule so changes to the oversight requirements basically what i mean by this is that a qualified individual has to be designated as responsible for oversight implementing and enforcing the institutions of your infosec program this QI has to report in writing to the FTC Board of Directors. Um, so you need uh, <clears throat> to be sure that you have um, design, designated uh, someone for this. Now, um, originally, like the original rule, uh, the first iteration of this rule required um, basically that that person be a chief information security officer, a CISO, which is a pretty, <clears throat> you know, industry uh, specific specialized uh, field. Uh, but the updated rule did away with the requirement that it had to be like a, um, like a act, like an official certified CISO, but that uh the requirement that they replaced it with was that the person uh, be trained and qualified for the oversight and implementation of of that um particular particular program all right so updates to the updated rule now in November of 2023, so last November, the FTC updated the updated rule. Hope you follow me. So this is the third, basically, evolution of the rule. So this rule goes 
into effect. Oh, look at and and basically almost a month exactly. So in May, May 13th of 2024 is when what everything we've talked about thus far is already in place and you should already be complying with it. Just to be clear, what we're about to talk about is what goes into effect that you better be doing before or at least by May 13th. Basically, it's a notice requirement to the FTC that it's imposed, okay? So, this update to the updated rule is meant to ensure that the commission, the FTC, the federal government is aware of notification events that could suggest your security program does not comply with their requirements. Okay, so basically it's a self, it, it is a requirement to self report, so to speak. Um, the extent that the reported information is made public, this information also is designed to assist consumers by providing them information to the notification event that is experienced by various um, financial institutions. So the final rule requires that the notification discovers that unencrypted customer information has been acquired without authorization must be sent to the commission. Now, the commission believes that this change reduces the number of notifications by excluding events where encrypted information was acquired while still ensuring that it received notice of events that are really likely to cause harm. So that, that little tweak of adding unencrypted customer information is really, it, it, it sounds burdensome, but it was intended to be as least burdensome as, as possible. If 500 or more customers are affected, then you have to report to the commission. And you have a time frame. It has to be done within 30 days. And unlike a lot of state laws, for example, our state law, there is absolutely no delay for law enforcement. This 30 days is from the day that you discover the event, which means that it is known to any person, any one of your employees, not you, not the boss, not the manager, not the supervisor, any employee, officer, or agent. So it could mean whoever you pay or whoever you, you know, pay to come in to maintain your systems, whoever you share your information with. They did, um, they did say uh, that, um, that they were going to provide a list um, of the contents of what this notice had to uh, provide. And it also uh, tried to make it easier for businesses by making the report uh, available to upload electronically on the FTC's website. And basically, there's only five pieces of information that they uh, that they need. You know, the name and contact of the institution, the description of the type of information, um, the date ranges, the general description of the event, and the number of consumers um, affected. Now, my last couple of minutes. I do want to, so if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in, because um, I don't want to, I, I want to be very cognizant of, of, of the time that, that you have uh, allowed me to be with you, and I, I sure don't want to take advantage and keep you over, but I, I, a couple of things I just want to point out. So this, these are summary slides. Um, if you maintain information on fewer than 5,000 customers, you're exempt from some of the safeguard uh, requirements. And my recommendations, remember, always talk to an attorney, uh, consider options for limiting your exposure. Like I said, don't, if you don't need it, don't collect it. Uh, conduct that gap 
analysis, you know, do your, your penetration testing and, and, and things like that to make sure that your systems are secure. You know, I mean, no system is 100% secure. And, and, and remember that, you know, the, the rule doesn't require absolutes. The, the rule requires, uh, you know, be, best available given the, the circumstance. So just, just remember that. And I think, I think that might be, oh, sweet. That might be it for, for y'all. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So we have a couple of really good questions. One, is the FTC the only government entity that can assess the $43,000 fine? So that's a super good question. And as a lawyer, I'm going to have to tell you, it kind of depends. It goes a lot along with, you know, preemption, uh, separation of you know federal and state government some states south carolina being one of them says that you as a business so if you are a business that is subject to our enforcement authority then our agency can enforce like as a as a as an in, as a consumer creditor in the state of south carolina you are required to comply with all state and federal rules so the answer to your question is uh you know specifically as far as the forty three thousand dollar fine yes that's going to be the ftc but if you're subject to say my enforcement authority under title 37 or any of the other programs palm brokers mortgage brokers whatever then um then I can fine you for not following state law, and then I'm required to send you up to the FTC. So you're going to get the $43,000 plus uh, probably a state fine. So I hope that answers your question. You're not going to get a $43,000 ticket for me, but you might get a $10,000 ticket for me, and then you're going to get the $43,000 ticket from the FTC. So hope that answers that one. Super good question. Uh, do I know of any providers who can assist small businesses with compliance? We just have a few employees. Th that's a super good question. As a regulator, I'm not I'm not allowed to point you to any particular one, but I can give you a recommendation. I would recommend that you contact your local um, Department of Commerce or your local small business association and they will be able to help you with that. And if not, then shoot me an email and I'll try to find you some more like referral resources. I'm just not allowed to um, pick a provider or provide providers because of my regulator status. Good question. Uh, I, th I thank you for, for joining us today. Um, I wish you a, a great happy rest of your week and great weekend. And be sure to uh, join us on our next uh, webinar. Thanks everyone for attending.